guys welcome to solo react talk today i'm going to be reacting to a video that's been requested by a viewer it's called what was the netherlands vietnam dutch war in indonesia 1945 to 1949 okay let's get started three two one go in 1940, the Germans invaded the Netherlands. And while the Dutch army fought back for four days, three days longer in Zeeland, they soon capitulated to the Germans. And while this was the end of the Netherlands' sovereignty in Europe, in Asia, the Dutch East Indies, known in Dutch as Nederlands India, continued to be sovereign. Now, of course, many in Indonesia were unhappy with this situation, namely the Indonesians themselves. And in 1929, already before the war started, there had been a national awakening, known in Malay as Kebangkitang Nasional Indonesia. And while this had been crushed, now that the Netherlands and Europe had been occupied, the question arose, what would happen in Indonesia? The answer came in the form of the Japanese Empire, who in 1942 set the Dutch East Indies in their sight and invaded the islands. Now, while the Dutch colonial powers fought back, they were subdued after about three months of fighting in most areas, and Indonesia became part of the Japanese Empire. The victorious Japanese rounded up many of the Europeans and certainly the soldiers who had fought against them and placed them in terrible conditions into prison camps. Many of the Indonesian nationalists saw the Japanese as liberators from the Dutch. And this is something the Japanese played up in a great deal with their propaganda, saying that they were coming to liberate them from the imperialist Westerners and that Japan was the only Asian country that had been able to stand up against them. At the same time, however, they forced many tens of thousands of Indonesians to perform hard labor for them and sent many of them abroad to work in camps there as well. In the meantime, they also trained many of these new militia and guerrilla groups, as you can see here, some of them just young boys, and indoctrinated them with the kind of fascistic mentality that many of the Japanese had when conquering their empire in Asia. Now, in 1944, when the war was going south for the Japanese, they actually promised the Indonesian nationalist leaders that Indonesia would become free, but they didn't give them a date. And mostly, this was just to keep them in line. Now, of course, the Americans went island hopping around the Pacific and liberated many of the islands under Japanese control. There was a plan to do so in Indonesia, but this never got off the ground. And so in 1945, when the Japanese surrendered, Indonesia remained occupied and garrisoned by Japanese forces, even though Japan had by now surrendered. While Indonesia was now technically returned to Dutch rule, the fact that British troops were closer and the Netherlands was still recovering from the war meant that the British promised to send troops to disarm the Japanese soldiers stationed there and return control to the Netherlands, although slightly reluctantly on the part of the British, as meanwhile in Indonesia, the Bersiap phase had begun. Now, Bersiap in Malay is a call to arms, and it means something like be prepared or get ready. And what essentially happened was that all of these groups and militias that had been indoctrinated and ideologically trained by the Japanese and armed with weapons had risen up and seized key locations throughout the country and started a kind of social reform. Now, this was led by a group called the Bermuda, which translates to the youth. And these, a lot of the time, continued to keep Europeans and others inside internment camps and also started to kill them and others that they felt didn't fit inside their new vision of an independent Indonesia. The victims included Europeans, mostly Dutch colonial administrators and their families, as well as Eurasians, so those of mixed race between Indonesian and Dutch, known often as Indo, also were targeted the Chinese community that was living in Indonesia that numbered many hundreds of thousands, as well as some of the Japanese soldiers who were stationed there and gave up their arms. They were taken into captivity, and then many of them were butchered when they were defenseless. Now, on the 17th of August, 1945, Indonesian independence was declared. And this was actually something that was done by an Indonesian leader called Sukarno, who actually wanted a more moderate route to attaining independence through diplomacy. But he was kidnapped by the Bermuda and forced to declare Indonesia's independence. And this is what happened on the 17th of August, 1945. Now, British troops had now landed in Indonesia to help with disarming the Japanese, but they found that they came under attack from Indonesian nationalists who were declaring the islands as their own. Now, 
Battle of Surabaya erupted between British soldiers, many of them from British India, and Republican Indonesian rebels. The fighting was incredibly fierce, and at one point the Indonesians set fire to an entire southern part of the city in an attempt to deny access to it for the British troops fighting there. The battle was ramped up after Brigadier Malady, a British brigadier who was under a flag of truce and attempting to negotiate a ceasefire, was surrounded by Indonesian troops and killed. The British, in a new attempt to take the city, stormed through and in the next three days, utilizing their special Indian forces, were able to capture all of Surabaya. By late 1945, the British troops in Indonesia started to be relieved by Dutch soldiers. And not just a few either. For the island alone of Yafa, they sent 55,000 troops to disembark. Now you might wonder then, why on earth in late 1945, you know, less than a year after the Netherlands had been liberated or most of the Netherlands had been liberated following a five-year period of occupation by the Germans, would they then choose to go to war in Asia? Now, one of the reasons was quite simply just that the Indies were a property of the Dutch Empire and they felt that it belonged to the Netherlands and that's why they should go back and take it. Now, there were already voices in the Netherlands saying that Indonesia, one of these days, was probably going to become independent as this was a trend that was happening around the world. After the Second World War, many of the colonies started to reach for independence. So this was something that had come up, but let's not kid ourselves, the Netherlands also wanted to take it back. There was a saying, however, in the Netherlands that India verloren, rampspoed geboren, which means the loss of the Indies, the birth of disaster. And so there was a very strong connection, a cultural connection to the Indies as well that is very important and shouldn't be neglected when looking at why the Dutch decided to get militarily involved in keeping hold of Indonesia. Now, another very important reason is economic, and this is because of the natural raw resources in Indonesia, like oil and the rubber plantations. This was another reason why the Japanese decided to invade Indonesia, because they needed the oil, and of course, rubber was also very useful to them. The Dutch government, of course, had to pay an awful lot to repair what the damage had been of the war in Europe, and so having Indonesia there as a cash cow, in a way, would really help them to do that. And of course, the Dutch had already been using Indonesia as a way of making money. So that's on a political kind of higher level. But many of the soldiers who went over saw it as their duty. And this included my grandfather, who served in Indonesia. And he stated, as many of the other soldiers, if you read their testimonies, do, that they had been living under German occupation in the Netherlands for five years. And they felt that the people of Indonesia were still living under Japanese occupation. Now, of course, this shifted because when some of them set out, Japan hadn't yet surrendered, and so that was true. The situation shifted slightly, and so many of the Dutch soldiers going over thought they would be seen as liberators because they had come to fight the Japanese and to free the people of Indonesia from Japanese rule. But some of them probably quite a lot of them failed to realize that the Indonesian National Revolution was also an aim at getting their own freedom. And so they would be fighting against Indonesians who wanted to separate from the Netherlands rather than those working for Japan. Although they were correct in that many of them had collaborated with the Japanese and had been ideologically trained by them. And that's where you get a lot of the very abhorrent racism that you see in the massacres, which was another factor for the involvement is that Eurasians and Europeans and other ethnic minorities were still being slaughtered in Indonesia. And that's also one of the reasons why the actions were called the Polichinela Axis, because they felt they were going back there to restore order after all of this social upheaval. That and the fact that right after the Second World War, they didn't want to call it a war, but political action, the policing action, sounds a little bit better in terms of PR. In November of 1946, after heavy fighting between the two sides and bowing to international pressure to solve the conflict diplomatically, the two sat down to agree to the Lingajati Agreement. Now, what this agreement basically said was that Indonesia would become an independent state, although not quite in the way that it had been envisioned, and that essentially the Dutch monarch would still remain the head of state. It would also be divided into the western and eastern half, the great eastern part belonging to the Netherlands, still under that control, while the east would have more independence. However, both the Indonesians and the Dutch were pretty unhappy with this agreement. 
The Dutch had wanted more control and wanted Sumatra to belong to them, while Sumatra had been conceded to Jaffa and the Indonesian nationalists. Many of the Indonesian nationalists saw the compromise as weakness and wanted full independence. Against the ceasefire rules of the agreement, the Indonesian National Army continued guerrilla operations against Dutch soldiers stationed there. And those Dutch soldiers stationed there, numbering 100,000, cost a lot of money to stand around doing nothing. And so when negotiations were bogged down, didn't seem to be going anywhere, the Dutch High Command decided to act. Operatie Product, or Operation Product, commenced on the 20th of July, 1947. It was made up of three divisions going into Sumatra and three brigades of Dutch soldiers going on to Yafa. And soon the Dutch troops had managed to flush out the Indonesian rebels as they were no match for the well-trained Dutch army and were able to take over most of the islands of Jaffa and Sumatra and the key centers, even though guerrilla activity against them did continue. Now, while this militarily was a huge success for the Dutch army, internationally this was seen as a breaking of the aforementioned agreement. And so pressure, especially from the United Nations and the United States, was mounted on the two sides to stop fighting. And this indeed happened in January of 1948 when they came to the Renville Agreement. Now, the Renville Agreement went on to form what became known as the Von Moak Lines. And these were essentially lines of control that divided Indonesia between areas that were held by the Republican rebels and by the Dutch forces. Now, the capital of Batavia, which is now Jakarta, was in Dutch hands, although the rebels then had moved their capital to Yogyakarta, which officially became part of the Republican-held territory. Now, these lines were then guarded by, as you can see here, Dutch soldiers and soldiers from the TNI, both of them. The negotiations continued, but really the two sides still did not trust each other at all. The Dutch were still pushing to try and get some kind of federation of the islands, whereas the Indonesians really didn't want to hear about it. One of the worst incidents during this time came when the Indonesian army moved from one side of the island to the other and then decided to engage Dutch troops when they had crossed the line. This was acting as a catalyst for further conflict and the Dutch, when they felt that the negotiations were going nowhere once again and the rebels were continuing their guerrilla activity against the positions, they decided to engage in Operati Krai or Operation Crow which commenced on the 19th of December 1948 and acted as a surprise attack, a final Dutch gamble to win the war in its entirety. What occurred is that early in the morning, Dutch airplanes left their air bases on Bandung and went and bombarded the capital of Yogyakarta. Now, at the same time, they dropped paratroopers into Maguo airfield and other strategic locations, which they then captured. The paratroopers, having done their job, they radioed in to the Dutch army, and the army crossed the Von Moak lines and into Republican-held territory. And once again, the soldiers were able to move in and decisively defeat very large numbers of the TNI, the Indonesian National Army's troops, and capture the leaders of the revolution inside the capital. As a result of Operati Krai, most of Jaffa and Sumatra fell into the hands of the Dutch, and 62,000 of the TNI were killed during the engagement. So surely it seemed like the Dutch had won their final decisive victory that they were aiming for. Well, militarily, yes, they had, but diplomatically, they were condemned by virtually everyone, especially, once again, the United Nations and the United States, who saw this as, once again, a breaking of a treaty. And therefore, they decided to really ramp up the pressure with the Dutch, and the Americans threatened to remove the promise of aid for building up the wartime damage and for repairing what had happened in the Netherlands with the Marshall Plan, and they threatened to axe it if the Netherlands didn't pull out of the areas they had captured straight away. And the Dutch, you know, they had spent almost half of what they would get in the Marshall Plan just fighting in the Indonesian theater, they had to pull out, and so they did. And on the 23rd of August, 1949, the roundtable conference between the Netherlands and the Republic of Indonesia was opened for discussion and negotiation to begin once again. And this eventually led to, on the 27th of December, 1949, so a year and eight days after the begin of Operatie Krai and what was going to be the decisive Dutch victory, the official recognition of the United States of Indonesia. They agreed that this would become an independent state. 
although they also agreed that they would pay the Dutch 4.3 billion pounds as reparations for essentially the war that the Dutch had fought there. And this is why the Netherlands then recognized Indonesia at this point. Although in 1950, they had a name change to simply the Republic of Indonesia. And they basically centralized the government that this island plan that the Dutch had gone for, the, uh, well, the Republicans already hadn't wanted that in the first place and they didn't get that. But then the United States became simply the Republic. In terms of lives lost during the war, between 45,000 and 100,000 Indonesian soldiers lost their lives. This is as opposed to between 5,000 and 6,000 Dutch soldiers. Also, let's remember that at the Battle of Surabaya and at the start of the war, around 1,200 British soldiers, many of them from India, also lost their lives. And also due to the massacres of the Bermuda at the start, also many Japanese soldiers lost their lives, as well as some who went on to fight for the Indonesians too. Finally, in terms of the civilian cost, anywhere between 25,000 and 100,000 civilians were killed, both by Indonesian rebels and by the Dutch moving through. These included Indonesian civilians, European, mostly Dutch civilians, those of mixed race descent, and the large Chinese population that lived in Indonesia during this time. Of course, this would not be the end of the interaction between the Netherlands and the Republic of Indonesia, as of course, parts of what is now Indonesia were still Dutch, even after 1949, and there would be more fighting to come but I will leave that for another video. So thank you very much for watching this video on the Dutch Vietnam, as I've called it, because I think most people that I know outside of the Netherlands don't really know much about this war at all, and most people within the Netherlands don't really either. But I hope it's been interesting. Do let me know if you like this video on the topic, because I think I will make some more videos on the Bolichinela Oxys, as they're known in the Netherlands, or the National Indonesian Revolution, or Indonesian National Revolution. So do let me know if you enjoyed it. Give me a thumbs up if you did, and I would really appreciate it if you would share it with anyone else who might find this interesting. So I have been Hilbert, and this has been The History. Um, freedom is never easy, it's never cheap, can't negotiate with people who are denying your freedom. I think this is something that's always been there in history, especially when it comes to imperialism and colonialism. I don't understand the arrogance, the audacity of the Netherlands and their way of thinking to, to say that all of Indonesia belongs to them. I don't understand that. I don't understand how this colonial mindset was able to endure after World War II. I mean, they should have understood the pain of occupation when they were occupied by Germany. They should have understood what it meant. But there they are, they're repeating the same nonsense again in, the, in, in, in um, Indonesia, seeing that they're coming there to liberate them from the Japanese. Everyone wants to liberate Indonesia, but no one ever asked the Indonesians what do they want. No one ever asked them. They all came there with their guns and their ideologies, the Japanese and the, and the Netherlands and uh, the United States and the United Nations. Everyone is coming there, but no one is talking to the people. Luckily, uh, the rebels did do something. I don't agree with their methods in terms of killing people of mixed race, you know, killing innocent civilians i don't i don't support that at all however if it weren't for their existence we don't know where indonesia would have been today because really i i, I don't understand the hold of this mentality that's in some european countries especially the ones that have um 
uh, colonized most of the world. When you talk about the Netherlands, you talk about England, you talk about France and Portugal and Spain. This mindset that they have that all of those lands that they conquered and occupied and terrorized and brutalized, they still say that they have ownership over them. And now I ask myself, hasn't World War II explained enough to them? Hasn't it shown them what happens when you are beat down? What happens when you are taken over? When you're occupied? But, hey, you know, I should try not get too angry on this. Um, it was a terrible time. Not only during World War II, but during the times of colonialism. It was a terrible time for many, many places across the world. And we are still trying to heal from that past. And sometimes I don't understand people who just tell us to get over it. You, these are things that you can't just jump over and just expect it just to, you know, poof out of existence. It, it, it takes time. It takes generations of people. Okay, guys, um, I guess that's it for today with this um, history clip. It's been very insightful. Um, I'm a bit angry right now i i need to calm down um if you like what you see you can give me a like you can comment you can uh follow my channel you can subscribe to my channel and you can also click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos okay guys that's it bye bye